Hello, welcome to this presentation of International Plumbing Code. My name is Thomas, and in this presentation, we're going to finish Chapter 7 on Sanitary Drainage. Let's pick it up in 711. All right, 711.1 talks about horizontal branch connections above or below vertical offsets. Now, this is on a stack. A stack is a vertical drain pipe. As it's coming down, it needs to move over. This is called an offset. Now, a vertical pipe is any pipe that is either straight up or it can be down to a 45 degree angle. That's still considered a vertical. So if we offset that vertical stack with two 45 degree fittings, it's considered a vertical offset. 711.1 says you cannot connect any horizontal branches into that within two feet above and two feet below the offset of that stack. Now the reason for that is that if you have a branch coming into those positions, the turbulence and movement of the fluids inside of that offset stack could interrupt the flow of that horizontal branch coming in. Now there is another note in 711.1.1 which talks about omission of vents for vertical stack offsets. When we get into chapter 9, we learn that these offsets need vents to help them breathe and to help that flow. But this omission of vents refers to the option that you can just increase the size of the pipe. If you size it as a building drain, and that's what they're referencing, it's going to be bigger. That would give more airflow inside of it, and you would not need to provide vents. 711.2 is similar to what we just looked at, but now it's a horizontal stack offset. So that vertical stack needs to move over, but this time we're going to use 90 degree fittings or something more horizontal. In this section, we learn the same thing. You're not to connect any horizontal branches within two feet above or two feet below that horizontal offset. But we're also told that once it goes flat and we get a horizontal drain, it must then be sized as a building drain. And as we learn in sizing, a stack may be able to handle a lot of drainage fixture units, but when it comes horizontal, it needs more room to flow. And a building drain is generally larger than a vertical stack because it is a horizontal pipe. Now, once you've increased the pipe size, say you've sized this as a building drain and it gets bigger, once it turns vertical again and runs into the lower stack, you're not going to be reducing the pipe size. We learned that early in this chapter. We just maintain pipe size or get bigger as we go. 711.2.1 also has an omission of vents for the horizontal stack offsets. Once again, an offset like this would require some special venting, but that could be eliminated if the stack and its offset are one pipe size larger than required for the building drain. So now we're really going to increase that size That'll give enough airflow and we would not have to provide vents. 711.3 talks about offsets below the lowest branch. So let's say we have a vertical stack, it's got horizontal branches coming into it, but then at the very bottom it offsets and there's no other connections below that. For a vertical offset, we will not have to change the size. However, in the case of the horizontal offset below that lowest horizontal branch coming into the stack, it would still need to be sized as a building drain once that pipe turns horizontal. Moving on, let's have a look at this picture. You see a foundation wall on the right side and a building sewer coming towards that from the left, coming up out of the ground there. Do you see a problem here? Ideally, the building sewer would be below the foundation. You can see a foundation and footing. You kind of want your drains to go under that. But in this case, the sewer out at the street was at a level that as we grade towards the building, this is as low as we can go. So that building drain is going to have to come right through the side of the foundation. But what do we do about fixtures that are below that in the basement? Well, this is where we're going to have to install a sewage ejector and a sump. This is far from ideal. No one wants one of these in their basement because it's not a matter of if, but when. The pump will fail, the sewer will back up, and you'll have to open that awful stinky rancid pit. But it is a possibility you can run all of the drains from that basement level to the sump and then have that ejected up out using a pump 
to connect to the building drain, at which point it can flow out by gravity. 712.1 says that if we're going to put in one of these building sub drains and it drains into a tank, then it shall discharge into a tightly covered and vented sump from which the liquid shall be lifted and discharged to the building gravity drain. Key words here, tightly covered. You do not want that sewer gas getting out into the building. And vented. When you turn on a pump and you're pushing out all of that liquid, that volume has to be replaced by some air. And without a vent, these will fail. 712.2 says that valves are required. You would need to have a check valve to keep the fluids from coming back into the sump after they've been pushed up. A full open valve so that you can close that off for service purposes. And also access must be provided. Please note that the full open valve should go above the check valve. This is so that when you need to service the check valve, and likely you will, you can shut off the full open valve and keep that whole stack of awful sewage from flowing out when you take apart the check valve. Also, please remember that the check valve itself is directional. There will be an arrow and it must be installed in the correct orientation in order to work properly. 712.3 goes over the sump design, stating that the sump pit itself must be at least 18 inches in diameter and 24 inches deep. Those are our minimums. Now you can buy some great kits for this from companies like Liberty Pumps or Little Giant. You can get the whole system with the sump, the pump, the connection points ready to drop in the ground. 712.3 talks about the ejector sump cover elevation. So we put that lid on it, that airtight lid, right? And that sump pit should be no more than two inches below grade or the floor level. They don't want this sunk way down into the ground, leaving a gaping pit inside the house. Now, admittedly, sometimes that's difficult because if you have a long run and you're picking up a lot of fixtures, the drain from those fixtures in the basement is going to slope down and the further it goes, the deeper it goes and that would push that sump down into the ground. Options, you can get a taller sump pit, but for me and the experiences I've had, it's kind of like, well, do your best. Sometimes I might have to build a false floor over that thing just so that there's not a gaping pit, but it's got to be where it's got to be. 712.3.4 talks about the maximum effluent level. That's the liquid that's inside that rancid sump. And it should not come up any more than two inches below where the waste comes into that sump. That's called the invert gravity drain inlet. Now another very important consideration is in 712.3.5 and that's the pump connection to the drainage system. When we have that pump lift that waste up and drop it into a gravity drain, that fluid, and especially that pumped volume of fluid, will affect fixtures around it. If that pipe connection is close to a toilet, it will siphon the toilet out. You've got to think, normal drains are just gravity flow fluid in a pipe. Pumped drains, this pipe is full volume, wall to wall filled with pressurized liquid. It's pushing. And that is very different in its behavior than a gravity drain. Okay, for that reason, we keep this connection away from any other gravity drain connections on the building drain. And the distance we need to maintain is 10 times the pipe diameter. So if you have a three inch pipe, you need to be 30 inches away from anything else so that you can keep things flowing and the pumped liquids don't adversely affect other drains. Now this applies to other type ejectors. You might put one under a sink or behind a washer in a place where you don't have drains for those fixtures. 712.4.2 talks about the waste ejector solids size and states that anything that will be receiving waste from a toilet would have to be able to handle up to two inch solids and kick them out. If it's not a toilet, like a sink, then the requirement is half inch solids. 713 goes over computerized drainage design and basically states that any of that sizing done by 
computers would have to be approved. 714, we look at backwater valve. And in 714.1, it says where plumbing fixtures are installed on a floor with a finished floor elevation below the elevation of the manhole cover of the next upstream manhole in the public sewer, such fixture shall be protected by backwater valve installed in the building drain or the horizontal branch serving those fixtures. What is a backwater valve? Well, it is a valve that stops sewer from backing up into the building. And here's how it works. There's a simple flap inside. It allows fluids to go in the correct direction from the drains out to the sewer. But if the sewer backs up, the flap closes and keeps the house from filling up with sewer. Some people love these because they've saved their basements from massive sewage floods. Some people hate these because they do have problems occasionally with causing clogs and blockages themselves, which may also flood the basement. <laughs> so let's have a quick look at how that works. You're at the building and you're looking around and you're trying to decide if you need one or not. Well, if you look out at the street and find the manholes, as long as your fixtures are above the manhole, they would not need it. But if you have a basement, consider example one here. The entire house is above the next upstream sewer manhole, so there's no backwater valve needed. The second example is probably most common, where the basement level is below the next upstream sewer manhole, so the main floor fixtures would not need to pass through the backwater valve, but the basement would. Now, if your house is on a hill with a steeper incline at the street, that sewer manhole may be way above the house. And in example three, the entire house is below the next upstream manhole. And so the entire house would have to pass through this backwater valve. 714.3 states the location of the backwater valve shall be installed so that access is provided to the working parts. You may need to get in, adjust the flap, or replace it, so you have to be able to access it. Now, most backwater valves can be purchased with an access kit, a pipe or tube that provides access right down to the valve, but obviously you wouldn't want it down that deep, because if it's too far down, you're going to have great difficulty reaching it and working on it. The 715 goes over vacuum drainage systems, and let me just tell you, they suck. <laughs> No, I mean like they actually suck. They're a vacuum. So <laughs> instead of having gravity pull the waste away, you have a vacuum hooked up and it literally just sucks all of the waste from the fixtures. So why would you use this? Well, one of the great things about it is that if you have a leak in a pipe, your waste isn't coming out into your space, into your walls. It's just sucking air in. So it's much more sanitary and it is used in medical facilities, hospitals, and things like that. Evac Solutions is one brand that manufactures these. Some of the selling points include the fact that you don't have to slope your pipes anymore. You can just run them anywhere. And this may actually save time and material on installation compared to a gravity drain. Consider a gravity drain system that has stacks and branches and vents and all of that so that it will flow. That's not necessary with a vacuum. But in 715, it talks about what these are in the scope, it says you should follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. There's information about testing demonstrations and also written instructions that should be left with the owner because this is not going to be your typical drainage system. They probably want a little more understanding. Section 716 is a relatively new section and it talks about replacement of underground building sewers and building drains by pipe bursting. How does this work? Well, rather than digging up the entire sewer when it needs to be replaced, you can dig a hole on one side where you'll pull a new pipe in, dig a hole on the other side where you'll pull that pipe through, and with a cable and a bursting head and some polyethylene pipe, you can actually drag a new sewer line below ground, breaking through the existing pipe, and it saves quite a bit of trenching as well as the disruption of the entire yard space or whatever other landscape may exist. 716 lays out a series of requirements when pipe bursting, including the restriction. You cannot do pipe bursting with anything larger than six inch pipe. So we had that limit. Now the process here is required to include a pre-installation inspection. That means you run a camera down before you do this whole thing. 
Uh, they talk about the pipe and fittings that can be used and that a clean out is required when you're done. And also afterwards, a post installation inspection is required. So you camera once more and verify that everything installed properly and there's no bellies or problems. Finally, 716.8 requires a test on that, you know, which you'd use the same kind of testing procedures that we do for any drainage. 717 is another relatively new section on relining building sewers and building drains using a fold and form pipe process. So when relining an old pipe, they'll fold up this formed pipe, it'll have some epoxy in it, they'll pull that in place and then expand that inside of the pipe using steam. Once that epoxy cures, then they cool it with air pressure. So this section gives a whole bunch of guidelines for that process as far as code is concerned. Uh, 717.2 says you cannot do this with anything larger than 4 inch. Once again, there's a pre-installation inspection. You would camera that through. But there's also a very thorough cleaning process where they clean the inside of the pipe and get as much junk out of there as possible. Code talks about permitting, prohibited applications, and in that prohibited applications section, it says if there's already a problem under there, say there's like a belly in the pipe, relining it's not going to fix it. In which case it would still have to be dug up and the pipe would have to be replaced and re-sloped, right? 717.6 talks about relining materials and 717.7 talks about installation requiring that you follow the manufacturer's installation requirements, right? 717.8, once again, there's going to be a post-installation camera recording where they see, okay, this has been installed, everything looks good, or if there's problems, those may still need to be addressed. Then there's a certification and approval process involved with this as well. And finally, 718 talks about rehabilitation of building sewers and building drains using a cure-in-place pipe method. So in this case, there's a felt tube that has the epoxy in it that's pulled in or inverted into the pipe. A calibration tube or basically a long balloon goes inside of there and just blows it up and pushes that epoxy against the walls of the pipe. It cures in place and then the calibration tube or balloon is pulled back out leaving the new epoxy lining which is adhered to the inside of the existing pipe. So there you have it. We have had a lot to talk about in chapter seven. Drainage is one of the most important parts of what a plumber does. And so of course, it's important for us to understand the proper way to install those. Let's go back to where we started in the beginning. The whole point and purpose of what we do as plumbers is to protect the health of our nation, to protect and provide sanitation. And this chapter is key as we work to accomplish that goal. I'll see you next time.